spotlighting Hawaii's leaders. We want to bring in Governor David Ige. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Lieutenant Governor, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Mayor Derek Kawakami. Thank you so much, uh, Senator, for being here. Spotlighting the issues. Where is the virus right now in our community? How much is this overall going to cost the state? How are you responding to the community's concerns? Talk about the level of citations that you guys are writing. Spotlight Hawaii with Yanji Denise and Ryan Kalei Suji on the digital platforms of the Honolulu Star Advertiser. This episode of Spotlight Hawaii is brought to you by Chaminade University. Good morning, Aloha. Thank you for joining us here on this Aloha Friday for Spotlight Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise, joined by Ryan Kalei Suji. And Ryan, we're taking a trip to the neighbor islands this today. <laughs> That's right. We're going to head on over to the island of Kauai. Joining us right now is Kauai Mayor. Mayor Derek Kawakami, thanks so much for joining us here this morning. Oh, thank you. Let's begin, you know, there's a lot to talk about, but let's first just start off with COVID-19 and what's happening over there uh, on Kauai. Give us an update on some of the things that you're seeing, what's trending right now and how things are looking right now on your island. I think just overall um, across the state, there's a level of um, cautious optimism. And here on Koi, it's, um, it, it's the same as everywhere else. You know, the state seeing a big downturn in the number of cases. We are seeing a downward trend, um, but we are always keeping an eye on things. And, um, and uh, Look, I, I couldn't say more except that people are doing the best that they can and they're doing a pretty darn good job as far as coexisting with this virus and getting on with their lives. You know, one of the big things that everyone has been watching, of course, is medical resources. And we know that Kauai uh, doesn't have that much when it comes to ICU beds and the like. Uh, how are you doing in terms of that and these traveling nurses? Uh, have you gotten some of that support staff and how much longer will they be there for you? I believe that our hospitals may have received some support. I know when we were in conversations with um, HPH, which runs um, Wilcox Hospital, and of course, um, KVMH on the west side, which is part of our state hospital system, um, they, they were giving us updates, especially during the hairy times of uh, the, the Delta variant surge. You know, we didn't hit that red line um, capacity issue that the rest of the state and their hospital systems were faced with. We we had a number of cases. Uh, we started to get um, uh, concerned about our healthcare capacity, um, but we were more so watching what was happening across the state because Kauai's little healthcare system is very much tied into um, Honolulu's and, and and Maui and Big Island as well. But for us, we. Um, you know, our, our nurses were, were probably working, you know, and, and getting their share of, of cases. But uh, when we talked to the leadership of the hospital system, you know, fortunately, um, they were able to maintain a stable level of um, service to our community. On other islands and really just throughout the nation, we've seen vaccine mandates that have begun uh, in certain communities uh, for people entering establishments or having to show proof of vaccination or a negative test in order to participate in large gathering events of, uh, of, some, si of some sort. What is your thoughts on this on Kauai and uh, your decision to maybe go against this and not mandate that? Well, we did it. We um, we actually established um, sort of uh, a vaccine um, testing program back in May 25th, I believe, when we hit tier five. And, you know, that had triggered some loosening of restrictions for professionally organized events. So those are the type of events where you have a wedding coordinator or you have a hotel reception in a ballroom. Um, in this case, uh, professionally organized events just means that you have someone as a point of contact, someone that will submit a COVID-19 safety plan. And um, the limits that were set on those type of uh, gatherings were 40 indoor and 100 outdoors. And if these professional organizers wanted to have a larger event, then there were a set of parameters that they had to comply with. And um, one of them was to require a proof of vaccination or negative test result. So, you know, we ran a program where vaccines and tests uh, were required, but they were much more targeted to what we felt were the higher risk um, sort of settings. Uh, we didn't 
follow suit with requiring tests or vaccines to enter into restaurants, bars, and our health clubs because we just wanted to see what was going to come out of it from you know the city and county of Honolulu and Maui. Uh, you know, at, at some point, government needs to realize that the people with the biggest skin in the game when it comes to the private sector are the business owners and those managers. You know, right now everybody's struggling to find workers, and you know these workplaces just cannot afford to have a whole bunch of their uh, workforce go down with COVID-19 or having to quarantine. So, you know, at some point, these these owners have been doing everything that they can. And we really felt that that level of responsibility um, is best left up to them initially, just to see um, how we'll be able to weather the storm and also to collect some data from places like Honolulu and, and, and Maui. And as we are today, we don't plan to um, impose any sort of vaccine passport program to the restaurants, bars, and fitness centers just yet. But we keep on observing. Let's talk a little bit about those vaccination rates. How is the county doing when it comes to the to the general population? Are you at a place where you're comfortable right now with how many people have been vaccinated? You know, right now we're really um, watching eagerly for the FDA to have the emergency use authorization for our younger keiki that are all in school. And I really think that's the next big um, operational step forward. Um, as far as adults, um, we're, we're starting to get more and more adults um, choosing to go and get vaccinated for a number of reasons. You know, from the very beginning, we kept Koi so safe that for many people, they may have underestimated um, COVID-19. Um, and of course, you know, the amount of information that's floating around out there, it can be confusing at times. But I think when we started to see our surge in cases, the situation became a lot more real, maybe a lot more tangible um, for some of these people. And so we, we've seen an uptick in vaccinations. But I, like I said, I, the, the next big thing on the horizon are the younger keiki. We hear a lot about these meetings that you have with the other mayors and with the governor, especially right now as Honolulu um, Mayor Rick Bangiardi announced that there could be some changes that are happening or coming uh, as early as today with regards to gathering sizes here in Oahu. But I'm wondering if you can share some insights into the types of conversations that are happening right now between uh, the other mayors and what you folks are talking through during this time about what's happening, best practices, anything that you can share that you guys are learning from each other during this uh, unprecedented time where decisions have to be made. Oh yeah, you know, we have a, a great working group amongst the, the, the four mayors and, you know, basically the conversations um, at times can be almost like an airing of the grievances, right? Where we all have like our moment to say, man, you know, what's working, what's not working. Um, but, you know, when you take a look at county by county, we're all dealing with um, the same situation under unique circumstances. And, you know, I think um, for the conversations that's been having um, as the most recent ones that we've been talking about, it is about how do we move towards uh, more normalcy? How do we start to coexist more? with COVID-19? How do we get more people um, to sporting events? And, you know, in, in a sense, Kauai has sort of been like a pilot project because, you know, we were allowing um, youth organized, organized youth sports such as Pop Warner football, Little League baseball. We even had our senior softball um, have their entire season from June 1st of 2020, and that was well before vaccines, um, you know, were really... Um, a part of our equation uh, with spectators. Um, and so, you know, I think in a, in a sense, Koi has served a purpose as far as showing um, how you can have some of these larger weddings or larger group events and have it done in a safe way. Um, so that's been the conversations is how, how do we start moving forward? And then, of course, we always talk about the uncertainty of a pandemic, the very nature of it is that we have to be flexible, we have to be focused, and we have to be ever vigilant and looking forward to um, what the next big challenge is going to be. 
One of the biggest challenges right now is getting visitors to come back in a safe way. The governor uh, indicated on August 23rd that Hawaii was not open for business and that folks should stay away for a time because of the stresses on our medical system. Do you think it's time for the governor to uh, sort of go the other way and tell people that it's safe to start coming back? And that's up for the governor to make that call because, you know, he's looking at a much broader horizon than I am. I mean, I'm lucky enough for my focus is right here on Kauai. And so I know that um, as far as Kauai situation, you know, we weren't seeing the case numbers coming in from visitors that were visiting Kauai um, as, as, as travel, as recreational travel. We were seeing a bulk of our cases from our you know, local residents going off and traveling, visiting family members, um, and then, of course, you know, becoming infected with COVID-19, um, bringing it home and then seeding the community with a virus, you know, and a lot of them just, you know, it was unbeknownst to them uh, until they started to feel sick and got tested. And so, you know, we try to uh, make sure that our response is um, in line with where we're seeing the case counts. And because we weren't necessarily seeing the case numbers coming from the visitor industry, uh, we were talking mostly to our people and what they can do. And um, I know the governor had made that announcement. Um, I think people were going to naturally um, cancel their trips um, just because of the situation going across the nation at the time. But, um, you know, I know the governor took a hit on it. Um, I would say that I think most people in his situation, uh, seeing the hospital systems on the verge of crumbling, and having to make some very tough decisions on who nurses get to treat and not treat. I'm pretty sure that, you know, uh, most people would probably uh, consider making the same call that he did. But, you know, for Kauai, we never made that call. Um, you know, I was interviewed by a radio station in LA um, the very next day that the governor made that call. And I cleared the air and said, I'm not sure what they're seeing on other islands, but I can tell you for Kauai, um, we just asked people that if they come to Kauai to just be respectful, just understand that we know they're spending a lot of money, but that it doesn't give them an entitlement to um, not be a part of this community. You know, when they land on Kauai, they're one of our people and we expect people to behave that way. Um, you know, our, and, and really that's what gets under the skin of people is when we, we have folks that visit um, and the very few that are disrespectful because most of them, let's face it, they, they enjoy this island and we enjoy them because there's a mutual level of respect. In sticking with this theme of tourism and, and visitors traveling to the islands, there have been some calls from those in the community, uh, very vocal here on our show through our comments, uh, asking that the state require visitors to get a second testing upon arriving, uh, you know, here at the airport in Honolulu or on your island when they arrive, uh, just as a second layer of protection ahead of them just being able to go out. Of course, they would still have to get approved a vaccination or a test before getting on a plane, but also a second one upon arriving. Do you think that that is something that is logistically feasible or even just financially uh, feasible? Well, we know it works, right? Because we also did that um, resort bubble program where you know visitors that arrived, they quarantined for three days on property and took a second test. and. Um, so we do have a proof of concept and we do have some data to um, verify that, that that does indeed work. I mean, put it this way, testing is, a, is one of the key pillars of disease management. In fact, it's, it's prevention and then, of course, detection. So the more testing you're doing, the better it is. But I would say that people need to look at the data and what the data says. The, the, the biggest threat to Hawaii is is our own people because we have the sort of contact with our friends, with our social circles, with our families. Um, and it's a much higher impact contact than visitors tend to have to. And so our visitors coming in that are COVID-19 positive, absolutely some of them are coming in, but that's not what the data is showing. And we have to also be mindful that these resources um, don't necessarily grow on trees. You know, we want to have a good healthy number of tests for our own local population. So just in case we start to see another surge that we have the necessary testing capacity to make sure that we can test everybody here that wants one. And so I think at times it, it, it boils down to one, where are the cases coming from? 
and two, uh, we have to be mindful that, you know, we do have an inventory of tests that we just don't want to just send them out just to send them out. But I understand where people's concerns are. And, you know, Kauai um, took those necessary steps when we felt that it was necessary. One of the things uh, that we do know from the data is that returning residents were part of the source of a lot of the virus coming back into the state and then, um, you know, in, you know, interacting with their friends and neighbors when they got back, let's say, from a trip to Vegas or what have you. Um, there has been a suggestion floated by Mayor Rich, Mitch Roth, and so far he's the only one that seems to support this, of having the folks that decide that they want to be in their own quarantine, uh, they're not vaccinated and they don't do a pretest, but they say they'll be in quarantine for 10 days. Uh, having those folks, having their names published in the newspaper, the governor has said that the attorney general is looking into the legality of this. The ACLU has spoken out against it. What's your take on that idea? Uh, the Mayor Mitch Roth saying that they simply don't have the resources on the big island to enforce all of these quarantines. And this would be a way to sort of let the community know who's supposed to actually be staying home. Oh, I love Mitch Roth. He, you know, that guy has got so many good ideas. And um, but this is one that just um, I, I wouldn't agree with him. I understand his intent. And believe me, at times as mayor, I have like said, man, you know, I just wish I could publish the names of these people that are really giving our people a hard time. But that's not the right thing for us to do. And uh, quite frankly, I'm not sure if um, that would be the legal thing to do, but it's just, I wouldn't want to do that. You know, for Kauai, it, it's a lot of work. And you're right, we don't have enough resources to make sure that we're checking in on everybody that should be um, complying with their quarantine or isolation orders. And they're always going to have um, some, bad, some bad players that just don't want to comply. But, you know, our police department, and our operation, they, they put in a significant amount of time. And I have to say the Koi District Health Office has put in a tremendous amount of time getting on the phone, verifying that the person on the phone is indeed the person that's supposed to be in quarantine. If somebody is violating a quarantine, they will coordinate with our police department to go and do um, some enforcement checks. And then when we do catch people, uh, we do really send a message by in enforcing as well. And I know it's a lot of work. I think it would be much easier to do it that route, but that's that's not what we want to do because I think there's a lot of unintended consequences that could come about. But I, you know, I, I think, you know, all the mayors, we we have these um we have great ideas and it's always um, you know, some of them are just a little trickier to pull off than others, and that would be a really tricky one to pull off. You know, side is your role of trying to help keep your community safe through COVID-19. The other side of this is the financial implication that it has on your overall budget to operate the uh, operations of government and keeping things moving along and the services that your co county provides to its people. How has COVID-19 impacted your overall budget? Uh, and moving forward, you know, we know that there was some support from the federal government, but knowing now some of the other things that are now required of COVID-19 with additional testing, with manpower, with support at airports, uh, you know, the, it does take its toll on the financial stability of each county. I'm wondering moving forward, how are you factoring in some of that as you look to put together another budget while also including what the implications of COVID-19 is doing overall to your county? Well, yeah, I mean, we just, you know, we, we ended up in, in the crosshairs of COVID-19, but also the legislature as well, right? I mean, we had our TAT pretty much scooped away from us, um, and that's money that goes, you know, all the way back to the 1980s where the legislature had, um, you know, recognized that, you know, the counties provide these critical services um, to the visitor industry and to our community. And so that's why the TAT tax is always appropriated to the counties and, you know, um, in the last session, we, we had those resources um, scooped away. And then we were um, offered a 3% TAT that we could impose. But then, of course, the DOE tax was prohibited from helping the counties out. So, you know, we had to scramble to find some workarounds. And we, you know, we have found a workaround. You know, our county council um, did approve a 3% um, TAT surcharge, which took effect, um, you know, on October 1st. And so at least we're going to be able to plug some of the pukas that COVID-19 and, um, you know, just, just the nature of 
government operations has left us in, but it's going to be a while till we fully recover. And, you know, and that's why, you know, we're ever so mindful of our spending. We put a lot of our money towards um, road resurfacing projects and capital improvement projects because that's the type of government spending that really creates um, economic revitalization. And that's where government should be spending their money right now. They should be spending their money to fix their roads and bridges, get their infrastructure up to order because those type of jobs um, usually hire locally and they're well-paying jobs. And guess who's spending money out at our restaurants and bars and our grocery stores? It's all those folks wearing those blaze orange t-shirts and hard hats out on the street um, that really help to stimulate our economy. And so that's how we are planning to have some of our economic recovery, um, but also we have to be mindful that the visitor industry is, you know, in a sense, the goose that lays the golden egg. And um, at some point in time, we're looking for an optimistic uh, return um, of our visitor industry and our visitors as well. Yeah, the return obviously could be the holiday season. Looking forward to that, you know, as what is your message to tourists who are planning vacations right now? Is Kauai open for business? Oh, we have been. You know, when you take a look at it, we were labeled early on as the island that was, you know, shut down, and we were. But when you take a look at where we've emerged, um, you know, we didn't have to layer any additional restrictions during the Delta variant. So right now, I mean, the basic restrictions are wearing a mask indoors, which, you know, yeah, is it great? But, you know, is it something we all can do? Yeah, we can all do it. It's, you know, it's not like a, you know, it's not that big of a deal, folks. And, um, you know, we have limits on social gathering sizes. Um, for Kauai, you can have a larger luau. You can have a larger wedding because we do have a system set up in place for our professionally organized events. And, you know, we've had our kids playing on our fields with spectators for a while now. And so, you know, my message to the visitors is like everything else, hey, you know, be safe, um, like stay on the beaten path, right? Don't get into trouble by getting too creative and trying to explore areas. But I mean, understand that you are traveling during a pandemic. And so there is a level of edginess that is going to exist and um you know but if everybody is pleasant and nice that's always a good golden rule to live by is be respectful in the middle of this pandemic not only were you having to deal with of course keeping people safe but also what was happening over on the north shore we know that there continues to be issues with some of the infrastructure areas there a landfall that blocked the access uh, to some of the residents on the north shore community something that we've been seeing more and more often in the past years can you give us an update on what the situation is like there with transportation going in and out of the North Shore community? Well, you know, that community is just taking that on the chin over and over and over again. And, um, you know, every time they, they get clipped, they just get back up and then they're stronger than ever. But, you know, they're, they're with the highway being open, but of course there is continuing work that, that needs to be done, you know, I'm pretty sure the businesses were very happy to see, um, you know, the, the customer counts start to pick up. But then again, you know, it's slowed down. I'm pretty sure they're looking forward to a, a good, healthy holiday season. Um, but, you know, the North Shore is just a community that has uh, been resilient and you need to be resilient to be able to live out there. And, um, you know, we're doing everything that we can to to, to help stabilize and help to get them recovered as well. You know, the sort of way of life that you're describing where kids can have sports games and the parents can watch, there can be luau's, there can be, you know, relatively large size weddings. There's not extra restrictions with Delta. What do you think that your county did differently to allow this kind of freedom that the rest of the state really has not been experiencing for the last two months? Well, let me preface what I'm going to say with, yeah, they can have larger events, um, but it does come with um, a set of rules and guidelines. And I, I would say that our key is having a strong enforcement presence. You know, from the very beginning, I have to thank our police department, our National Guard, even our planning department was involved in enforcement. And we said, look, these are going to be a new set of rules and standards 
that people have to live by that we're not used to. So we're going to have to we're going to have to really get it to our community that these are these are rules that we need to follow. And, you know, we got buy in from the police department to to really, um, you know, enhance enforcement. The National Guard provided support. And um, I think that that's step one is it, no sense create a whole bunch of rules if people are going to be allowed to break them. And then the ones that are following the rules are watching the ones break it, getting away with it. And they're like, well, you know, are this, is this real rules or not? Right? No, they're real rules. So I think step one is before you throw out a rule, one, ask yourself, can we effectively enforce it? Because if not, you know, it, it erodes every other type of action that we try to take to keep the community safe. Um, other than that, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what we're doing different. Um, I, I think our Koi District Health Office has done a fabulous job by contact tracing um, in the face of getting yelled at. You know, these are contact tracers who, who are just trying to like keep the community getting sworn at um, and, and dealing with the level of abuse that they had to take. And, you know, they're people too, right? And um, to have the resilience to show up to work and say, all right, I'll get my shoes on, do my job and keep this community safe. I mean, um, our hospital system has really done a fabulous job as far as helping with testing, vaccines, being a part of our mobile vaccine um, clinics. And I think just, you know, Kauai, you know, there's a level of um, accountability, right? You cannot just go and make a fool out of yourself in your neighborhood because then the whole neighborhood knows. And, you know, that's what happens in small communities. So I think that there is a level of accountability that comes with a smaller community. Of course, we're not teeny, tiny, small, we're quite, you know, big, well, 72,000 plus people. And um, I, th I think it's a combination of all of those factors, accountability to our community and um, having fantastic workers that just love this island. Well, as we wrap up here this morning, uh, we thank you for being a part of it, but want to allow uh, you the opportunity just for a final message here uh, and, and what you would say looking forward as you continue to navigate through these uh, somewhat difficult times and uncertainty. Well, what is your message to the Kauai residents and, and really to the uh, those uh, others who are watching throughout the state? Yeah, you know, this is a long operation. I mean, I don't think many people had um, ever visualize that this um, virus would be sticking around so long and um, I want to I do want to thank everybody for their patience I know at times it can be frustrating believe me folks we are trying our absolute best some of the things that we do we're, we're going to get it wrong and um, some of the things that we do we're going to get it right but you, we're trying our absolute best with what we have and we just want people to really be nice to each other I think that's what this world needs more of right now. It just seems like everything is focused on, you know, just some um, conflict and division and, you know, um, try to help each other out. Try And even with people that we disagree with is try to be patient. You know, we're going into the holiday season. It's going to be another rough holiday season for many families. And, you know, some of these folks that, you know, may be, you know, frustrated, might be going through a lot. So just try to be understanding with people's situation. And, um, you know, let's just try to help each other out. Thank you so much, Mayor Derek Kawakami, joining us live from his office on Kauai. We really do appreciate your time on this Aloha Friday. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Aloha. Thank you. Well, great to hear from him. And it's really interesting to see sort of how he has navigated through this pandemic as a leader, because we do remember that at the start of this, Kauai had some of the most restrictive uh, rules when it came to traveling to their island. They had the resort bubbles that he referenced and really just trying to make sure that no one came to the island with COVID because they do have such limited resources. But as you heard him lay out in the face of Delta, they have still been able to maintain many of the things that residents on the other islands have been calling for, especially going to sports games for uh, friends and family of, you know, Little League and whatnot, Pop Warner that he talked about, and also having some of those larger gatherings. Of course, he emphasized repeatedly that those are, you know, not just free-for-alls, they do come with restrictions, but I think there are wedding planners and folks here on this island who would welcome that opportunity. 
And that is one of the things that many planners here on Oahu have been asking for is the opportunity to have these events uh, through structured rules, uh, as the mayor pointed out, and, you know, Kauai counting being able to continue on, even in the midst of Delta, to set some of those guidelines and allow their community to be uh, organized in this manner and allow things to continue to happen while also making sure that uh, they're keeping an eye on those numbers and those hospitalizations. And like we're seeing on you know, all the islands, Kauai also seeing some of those numbers decreasing uh, with also the vaccination rates continuing to increase, especially in on an island like Kauai in some of those more rural situations and rural areas being able to provide access to the vaccine for those who may not necessarily be in a more populated area. Yeah, and interesting when you asked him about the possibility of having some vaccine verification, like what we see here with uh, Safe Access Oahu and Safer Outside on Maui, he said that for now he's watching those other counties to see how those programs are playing out, but it doesn't sound like something that Kauai will be seeing anytime soon. Similarly, Mayor Mitch Roth's idea of publishing the names of people who elect to be in quarantine doesn't sound like he's going to be doing that either. Yeah, just a different contrast to hear what different mayors uh, are seeking on each of their own islands and also the conversations that they have with one another talking about how they sort of use it as an opportunity to share their grievances. Of course, these mayors can relate to each other in ways that no one else probably can in the state. And so he uh, was very positive in the saying about the conversations and the working dynamics that he has with the other mayors and with the governor and moving forward how they navigate through this time and uh speaking of the governor we'll be hearing from him on monday that's right he'll be joining us as he does so often on monday at 10 30 and then on wednesday we'll be hearing from honolulu mayor uh rick blangiardi to hear you know what his thoughts are on restrictions we know that he has been very pro-business and um had really resisted adding those restrictions but he said that hospitalization sort of forced his hand is it time now to lift some of them we'll be talking to him about that on wednesday we hope you have a great weekend we'll see you right back here with governor Ige on monday aloha aloha this episode of spotlight hawaii was brought to you by chaminade university